Hi, hello. Hi, hello. Hi, hello. How are you? I'm Craig. Uh, this is Flooded and my take on the week. Uh, there are, well, there's been a few things happening this week, but I'm only going to talk about one because of time restraints and your probable interest in watching this video. I'm going to talk about the flags and the flag. I'm talking, the reason I'm talking about them is they're still kind of like trending on Twitter. Everyone wants to talk about flags. Uh, what's happened is that, um, well, the, the, the union flag, uh, or Jack, as some people call it, it I... It, it, the, a jack is a flag on the end of a boat, so it's technically the Union flag, but it doesn't really matter, right? So let's call it Union flag, because <laughs> that's it, so. Uh, and uh, we, we see it all the time. Now, we've seen it with uh, David Bowie's worn the flag, and uh, we've seen uh, Oasis have worn the flag, Spice Girls, James Bond has skied off a cliff with the flag as his parachute. It's very much uh, like typical touristy, come to Britain, there's the flag, there's Buckingham Palace, uh, you know, the Jubilees, we see the flags, 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 flags. It's Great Britain. That's their flag, the flag. And uh, but there's some people who think the flag is kind of like a right wing thing. And of course, as usual, as everybody does, whenever you refer to the right, they, they focus in on the tiny minority of the far, far right. And they think that the far, far right represent all of the right. And likewise, the right look at the left and they think that the far, far left represent all of the left. And it's just this backwards and forward and of, 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 bad attitude and bad behavior of people to each other. Um, and what's happening is that, um, well, in comedy, for example, comedy is about punching up uh, quite often. That's like why so much comedians, so many comedians are left wing because they're, if they're political, they're, they're punching up and the conservatives are on the right wing and are quite, are seen as like capitalists and they believe in uh, making money and big business. Uh, whereas the left look are much more uh, seen as being much more community driven and giving back to the people. So, uh, so you have them sort of talking about the flag and the flag is what you want. We don't have the flag. We don't like the monarchy. You know, there's that element there because the monarchy are wealthy, you know. So, um, so the flag is kind of seen as like a demonic thing sometimes by the left. Now, when you work at the BBC, you have a uh, thing, you, you're kind of required to be impartial. And be, to be impartial, you, the viewer should not know what your political leaning is and I think what's happened is it, it was a bit of a, a... Charlie State made a joke and it fell flat and then Naga Manchetti kind of took it to a different sort of place. Watch the clip and uh, you tell me what you think. Um, I'll just play it here. This is from the Daily Express of all papers, but it's the clip. So it's only one I can it's find. just a little bit small, but uh, that's your department, really. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I missed just... that because I tapped my mic. That's why we view this as more than just a housing Charlie State's issue. about to comment it's on the flag behind him health, and the about picture of the justice queen. system uh, and about our immigration system. We need to bring all that together into a proper strategy so that we can end rough sleeping over the course of this parliament and no one should have to live on the streets. Robert Jenrick, uh, thank you. I think your uh, flag is not up to standard size uh, government interview uh, <laughs> measurements. I think it's just a little bit small, but... Uh, that's your department, really. <laughs> it's just a thought. The picture of the queen. The picture. You, uh, you, oh, you'll the be picture, aware that you'll be aware that every every time we have we we've seen it every day, haven't we? There's, it's, it's, it's a stock Always a flag. thing, isn't it? Always a flag. Go. I had the picture of the queen there as well, though, in the Westminster office. I'm assuming. Right. So, I mean, you can read into that what you like. Uh, my when I thought I didn't think, I didn't think it was too bad. I, what I don't like is the, the laughing for hundred percent tariff free. Um, because Charlie State doesn't laugh; he doesn't laugh much. Uh, but she's like looking off camera to someone else who's laughing. It's almost like uh, a, a revealing of their like they think that the flag is like embarrassing, you know. As I think he's got another flag. Oh my god, too many flags. What's with all the flags? It's the government. The, the government. That guy is kind of what is he? He is the Secretary of State for Housing Communities and Local Government. He's got a UK he's representing he's got a flag. It's it's completely appropriate that he would have a flag there and a picture of the Queen. Uh, and and it's hard to get why and these guys are representing the BBC, so why the BBC thinks uh that we should laugh at that. Why should we laugh at the flag? So she got in a wee bit of bother because um, what happened was something started trending on Twitter where people were tweeting out all the time 
uh, about the flag joke, I mean, making jokes about the flag, and she was liking the tweets. So then she had to, um, and I'll just do a quick search here. Uh, uh, she, <laughs> there you go. So if I just share this with you, she, um, she had to apologize for liking the tweets. Which it might be, you know, might seem a little bit silly. Uh, it says TV host Nagy Manchetti has apologised for liking offensive, in very commas, offensive tweets, uh, referencing a flag that appeared in an interview with a government minister. Can I just flag, flag, uh, the the very commas around the word offensive there, which you probably can't see too well, but um, you know, I'll zoom in a little bit. Whoop, there you go. Oof. Yeah, so the the I, no, it's not a big thing really, but um, it's when you when you put. Uh, quotation marks around the word you're quoting what somebody else has said somebody else has said they're offensive the bbc aren't saying that all the other words about quotations the bbc is saying the word in quotations the bbc didn't say but you can imagine that if there was another situation where um uh there would be absolutely no there would be no um doubt in the bbc's mind that the tweets were offensive where they wouldn't use those um you say it was, say it was a comment about religion Somebody had said something about religion. The BBC, would, I, I'm, I'm, I can't say for sure, but the BBC would pretty much not put the word offensive in quotes, I don't think. Maybe that's not a fair play, but it's something I thought about as I was watching it. I was going, are the BBC still not seeing that joking about the flags is not something they should be doing? Anyway, reading on. On Thursday, she and the BBC co-host, co-host Charlie State drew attention to a flag and a picture of the Queen behind Housing Secretary uh, Robert Jenrick ending the interview, State jokingly mentioned the size of his flag. Uh, Manchetti said she'd removed the likes. Uh, so she started liking these tweets. She said she'd removed the likes and that they did not represent her, the views of her or the broadcaster. You see, it's really interesting that when you like a tweet, um, it, you, yeah, it's kind of what you're doing when you do that. You do like it. You're liking it. Don't If you don't like it, don't like it. That's what I would say. So they do kind of represent her view. And I think that's that's what's key. And I'll get to in a second why this is happening or why it's happened. And it's a big problem. They've got to fix it. And they've got to fix it by doing exactly what they're doing, which is saying, stop it, delete that, take it down. This has got to happen for the BBC to get back on track. Um, she, she added, this, the, this do not represent the views of me and the BBC. I apologise for any offence taken. I mean, that's... Fair enough. She's not apologising for remove for, for liking the tweets. She's apologising if you got offended. That's fair enough. A lot of people have sort of spun that as being, well, you don't apologise for liking tweets. That's not what she's doing. She's apologising if it offended people. She's still not conceding that she thinks they're a joke. She has, she she doesn't say that. She doesn't say the union flag is something we're all proud of and I, I fully support the use of the flag. Not that I can see. Um the BBC declined to comment in September. The corporation's incoming director general, Tim Davey, warned BBC staff about their use of social media. Let's have a look at this. Here we go. So um, the BBC boss prepared to fire stars who break impartiality rules. This is what we all wanted to hear. This is what they have to do. In fact, from moving forward, they should build into contracts that if you tweet stuff that makes the viewer understand that you are politically, that you vote in one particular direction or you're, 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 you have a political bias, then you've kind of failed to be the impartial representation of the BBC that we, we require. Um, a lot of people put into their bios on Twitter that, you know, oh, I, I just have fact that, you know, my, what I say here on Twitter has got nothing to do with the company I work for. That's nonsense. You can write that all you want in your bio. If you are presenting yourself from a perspective of being, I don't know, a an activist on the left or an activist on the right or whatever you are, you those perspectives you have are going to be reflected in decisions you make throughout your day. And it could be that if you're somebody who interviews someone, say you say your job was to interview somebody from the Labour Party and you were a Labour Party supporter, you would give that Labour Party 
uh, interview, maybe, without even knowing it, you might give them a little bit more time. You might not ask such a tricky question. Or you might ask a tricky question with a huge beam on your face and a smile. You might make a little joke at the end of the interview to make it all warm and nice so the viewer comes away thinking, no, oh, that was a nice little interview, right? And you might not realise you're doing it. And then you don't like the conservatives, so you ask them cold questions. You, you stare at them and you're not you're completely different manner to them. And, and you don't realise you're doing it. And, uh, and, you, and, you, and you ask a short goodbye I a question at the end and a goodbye and a bit more it's a bit more frosty right you might not realize you're doing it and this is what bias does to you you know we've all heard about racial bias at work it's a it's a similar thing but your biases affect in tiny nuances little things that you do in your behavior and your mannerisms so that's why it's important that the BBC selects people who don't have these biases. Now, it's not okay. I, I, for me, it's not even okay to pretend to say, okay, well, I do support Labour, I do support Conservatives, but I'll just pretend I don't and I won't let that out. I don't think that's good enough. I think they can only employ centrists, people who are on the centre, who aren't triggered by things that happen on the right and aren't triggered by things that happen on the left and want to hold both people to account or both sides to account. And the way you have to do this, I think, is through some sort of, um, uh, I don't know, some sort of uh, test that's, uh, what's the word? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I, can't, I can't remember. A uh, cognitive test. There you go. It's some sort of cognitive test to, to work out where you are thinking by a series of like well thought out questions. There's already cognitive tests about you know where you are in your political spectrum, but but a lot of people question uh, the question that how those questions have been asked. But I think that's quite a good thing to do in the interview stage is to say okay, here's a little questionnaire for you to fill in, or it'd be an online thing. Just fill in the answers you can. You've got ten minutes to do it so that they can't have don't have time to go away and research the right thing to say. Uh, and um, I think that might be quite useful because, like, oh, well, this person's clearly, like, you know, an activist. <laughs> we you know, we don't want them working in the news. Uh, and the other thing is that the BBC does need to start sacking people who are misbehaving. And um, the, the, it's not, the thing is, it's not really their fault that they're misbehaving. And I'll quickly touch on it uh, because I don't want the video to go on much longer. <laughs> I don't want the video to be too long. Uh, but um, let me... Uh, so... The, what, what what happened was about uh, 2000, um, the BBC started getting a lot more competition from Channel 4 and Channel 5. Uh, and uh, things were getting... Uh, you see, the BBC was, has always been very, very comfortable in being sort of the monopoly broadcaster. And they were very, very good at what they did. And they practiced impartiality, I think, quite well, because I worked there, by the way. And I was I went through the whole training process. I did two years training at the BBC as a producer. So I knew the guidelines inside out and I knew what the rules were. And it was pretty good. Uh, and then, and I remember seeing this, and I was, I, I, I'll tell you a story in a second, but they started... Uh, feeling threatened by what Channel 4 were doing, what Channel 5 were doing. They were being very edgy. We had the big breakfast. We had uh, sort of late night stuff happening on Channel 5. It was all sort of attention grabbing stuff and it was working. And the BBC were kind of losing like the younger audiences. So they tried to sort of um, get clean, claim back that edginess. But they're, you know, the BBC is an institution and when you get a job there, you, you're there for life and you've got a pension. So there wasn't enough new talent kicking around. So they started hiring in on a freelance basis, new producers. Uh, and of course, you, they got like the um, uh, Ian Katz did um, Newsnight and then Paxman was off. You know, and uh, things started changing very, very quickly. Now, obviously, if you're somebody who's had a, a lot of success working at The Guardian or working at Channel 4 and had a huge hit show, and then the BBC asks you to come in and do a show for them, uh, you're going to be kind of like a little uh, new kid on the block, but you're kind of a bit cocky because, frankly, the BBC want you to come and do your stuff. Come and do the stuff that you did over there with us here. Now, that what you, what the BBC couldn't do was say, oh, by the way, here's our rules on how to be like us. They're paying for people to come from these channels to start making the edgier programs. So what happened was the producer guidelines started getting pushed to the side a little bit and uh, people didn't stop paying so much attention to impartiality. And that kind of worked its way down through the executive producers who were selecting new talent and new uh, presenters. And uh, it became kind of part and parcel of the culture to an extent. People were still being told that you had to be impartial, but it became a little bit looser. And we started seeing biases being really evident. Now, a lot of people argue that some of the biases of the BBC are like they're more right, right wing, actually. 
And some people say, well, the more left wing. You, see, you could look at somebody like um, Andrew Neil. Uh, like, well, he's, is he more right wing? Probably. And then you look at somebody, I don't know, like Nagy Manchetti or um, Emily Maitlis. They're left wing for sure, for definite, for top of the chart. I don't remember they got uh, James O'Brien in and they got rid of him because he was too left wing. And, I, and so, you know, they, they were trying to keep on top of it because obviously people complain and the people are paying for this. You know, we're paying for them. We're pay, the BBC is funded by our TV licenses uh, and uh, we care about them being impartial. So that is kind of what happened. Uh, the BBC has a lot of fixing to do, but I think that this is the right step forward and um, people need to watch what they do on Twitter. Uh, and that is pretty much what we're going to see happening pr soon, is that the new talent coming through in the next five years or so are all going to be much more careful about what they're saying on Twitter. And my advice to them, if I was the producer, is like, uh, or if, you know, if I was advising the BBC on doing the contracts, is don't say anything at all. In fact, try and try and live without your Twitter account. Um, I think Twitter's going to change soon too. Uh, in that, I don't think uh, either an anonymous account should exist. So uh, people are going to have to be held a lot more to account for what they're saying. It won't do. By the way, you know, um, I will wrap this up. But Hugh Edwards uh, went off and made a little joke about it himself. He said, "Flags and." He tweeted this, but he made a joke saying, uh, this is my new backdrop at BBC News at 10, and it was the Welsh flag. All coinciding, I think, with uh, some rugby match or some game happening. Uh, but obviously you can't do that. And why can't you do that? Because you can't go on Twitter and say, this is my new, B tagging BBC News at 10, this is my new uh, backdrop. The this is presenters uh, working with it inside BBC buildings uh, sitting on BBC sofas using BBC equipment with BBC staff and BBC money, laughing at the, the 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 flag thing, the flag story. It's all become a bit of a joke to them because they're not getting it. They don't get it. They're older school. You know, they come from a time when um, they've learned that it's okay to make a joke about this on social media and that, and that they can't be touched. Well, um, they kind of can, and he was told to take that down. He said, gutted my pro flag. Tweet has been cut down in its prime uh, my or by order, but it will be back tomorrow by popular demand. Meanwhile, enjoy this magnificent flag from one of my favourites, the BBC. For me, that's um, I would have a word of him about that as well because he's kind of, um, he's not taking it seriously. He doesn't get it, and he's got the last word in there, and it's... It, you know, these guys won't be at the BBC in the next five or ten years. And part of the problem with the BBC is that they're not there's not a big enough turnaround of staff. I think that they should train people uh, to do to, to a certain uh, level uh, and they will just naturally leave because there should be a cap on how much the BBC pays anyone who's in front of a camera. There's like no more than, I don't know, 350,000 or something like that. I don't know. I don't know the economics of it. But cap it. And then when you've got ITV offering you a million... Go to ITV and do stuff for them for a million and we'll we'll train up somebody else and make a new star. Thanks for watching. That's me talking about flags. Have a lovely day and cheerio.